Hey guys, welcome to the Go Solo Show. I'm Johnny Quirk and we're back once again with some amazing stories on how to start, run and grow a winning business. So on this week's show, we're yet again talking about one of my favourite subjects and that's because it's all about how to start, run and grow a coffee business. And today we're meeting some amazing people from all over the globe who successfully built a business in this space. So a very warm Go Solo welcome to our guest today, which is Jake Healy of the Golden Gecko Coffee Co. Jake, great to have you here. Great. Thanks for having us. Great to have you here. Uh, Lucas, Lucas Spinoza, you're from Black Sheep Coffee in Niagara. Great to have you here on the show. Thanks for having me, Johnny. Appreciate it. Nice one. And also we've got Jimmy Dimitrov of Sweden. Uh, I think it's Sweden Coffee. Is that right? Uh, Sweven Coffee. Sweven Coffee. <laughs> this is great. And you're based in Bristol, UK. That's correct. Yeah. Amazing. Thanks for having so, me. We've got someone else here from the UK, but as everybody knows, it's a global affair on the show, so I'm delighted to have you all here. Okay, so it's a great combination of guests with so much great stuff to talk about this week. So let's start off. So um, for regular visitors to our show, uh, regular kind of like, you know, audio and video kind of uh, people, you'll know that we always kick off the show by having a deep dive into what the businesses are and what sets them apart. So let's kind of go with you first, Jake. Um, you know, in a nutshell, what is your business? Who are your customers and what sets you apart from everybody else? Yeah, so we're a local coffee shop in Toronto's West End uh, in Canada. Um, the business started off as a, uh, a roastery. So we actually roast our own beans. Um, we're still a single shop. And basically we're very community centric. Um, for me, coffee was always about uh, bringing people together. Um, and so the, the shops evolved into a very family friendly uh, location. Uh, we offer a lot of different sort of products beyond the coffee. Um, and, you know, for me, I've always said it with my team that I, I uh, employ is that customer service is the biggest difference. You know, anyone can go anywhere to get coffee, but we've, we offer very friendly, you know, we get to know our customers um, and that's the part we enjoy the most. So, yeah, that's what sort of sets us apart in, in a Toronto market. Amazing. And community and customer service is so important. I mean, it's, it makes everything when you go for a great meal, if the service is bad or you don't feel part of it, it just is those, those two things are just part of the big jigsaw. So amazing that you've kind of uh, obviously said that today. Lucas, your own business. Tell us more about it. Well, my, my story is a little opposite. We started as a cafe and became a roaster halfway through our, uh, um, our experience here in Welland, which is a, a small city in, in Niagara, which yeah. is uh, in Canada, because there's two Niagara's, there's Niagara USA and Niagara Canada. We're side by side, separated by water, but we're on the Canadian side. Um, and so, yeah, we same thing. I think every specialty shop community is central and it's uh, it's a big part of why we do what we do is building on community and neighborhoods. And uh, Welland is a small city, so we lacked a, a bit of a community hub. So we opened seven years ago almost now and uh, we've become that kind of a place. But when we were a cafe, our customers were different um, than now as a roastery. So we have, you know, kind of two different customer bases, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about later. So. Of course. No, that's great. And again, you know, a, a brilliant story as well of working out kind of what you want to do and changing up the business mm. when the time seemed right as well. Jimmy, yourself, yeah. tell us more about your business. Um, we're a small specialty coffee shop here in Bristol. That's in the southwest of, of England, not far away from, um, from London, actually, about two hours away. Um, what we do, we opened just before the pandemic, actually. Wow. Um, no, that's brave. So, uh, yeah, no, we actually didn't know because it was two months <laughs> before the pandemic. Kicked off and we didn't have an idea and we were like quite, you know, like, yeah, we'll, we'll smash it. We'll do really well and so on. But we actually did really well, which, well, which I'll probably talk about later. But yeah, what we do, let's get back to that, is we serve really high grade specialty coffee mm. to our customers. Um, and we do it in a specific way. We, we have really specific equipment and water specifications, techniques, and um, what sets us apart, I guess, from other cafes is that we're open plan bar. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually, everything's on the counter. Yeah, okay. So all of our customers that walk in, they face us. Uh, yeah. And probably 90% of what we do is customer service. Yeah, okay. We, we talk to people so we've had quite a few baristas already and we still have that that are saying we've never worked in a place like that because 90 percent of of your work is talking to people 
Yeah. And this is the most important aspect for me as a barista and as a coffee shop owner is to actually to elevate customer service, to have the personal um, kind of communication and approach to people. And what we, we are established as, as a small cafe, not just as serving coffee, but also build a solid bridge between between the actual coffee producers and the consumers. And, yeah. and this is really important for us as well. Every single coffee that we serve is really transparent. We know everything, the way we serve it, the, the way it's all presented and everything. It's, it's everything is attention to detail. Yeah, uh, and to be honest, you know, it, it. I think obviously we'll dig deeper in terms of kind of like how you've grown the business later on, branding, that sort of stuff, which we'll cover today. But I mean, you're yeah. right. I think all three of you have said community, customer service experience there's a lot more you know i, I have a, a bean to cup um, machine downstairs which again gets a lot of hammering for people who listen to the show a lot you'll know i have two small kids so it gets hammered a lot to keep me awake as the day goes on but when i go to our local coffee shop up the road it's great they really care about what they do it's an experience you chat with the owner it feels like a community you bump into people yeah. you know it's a lot more than just that kind of quick caffeine fix and a, a feeling on the mouth for 30 seconds or whatever. And I think what you guys have all done is, is growing your business and clearly you're in. This moves me on to my next question, which again, I'm going to actually hit you up for Jake as well. Like we'll kind of carry on maybe in this order a little bit, see it's going well. You know, there are many reasons why you decide to get started in, in any kind of industry. You know, what was it that, that really made you go into this? You know, where does the passion come from to do what you do? Yeah, I, so if you can't tell from the accent, I'm an Australian. Um, I'm a transplant to Canada. Um, and in honesty, when I landed here about 10 years ago, the coffee industry wasn't very mature. You had Tim Hortons and Starbucks, yeah. and that was it. Um, big brands. The local coffee scene wasn't really growing. Um, in Vancouver, where I landed, it was kind of cool. The West Coast has always been a little bit um, more advanced. So when I moved to Toronto, um, I guess it was about uh, bringing that passion of coffee from Australia um, and just sharing that enjoyment with, um, with local people, uh, communities, that sort of stuff. Um, the roasting side of it, again, was just something out of curiosity. I did it while I was still working my corporate job, yeah. um, sort of just practicing, experimenting, and then got to a point where I went, you know, I'm either going to do it now or I won't. So I opened a brick and mortar sort of coffee shop um, and just, yeah, it sort of, learned a lot but also it was um just to bring that experience of australian coffee where it's again in australia it's very much about food and coffee together um yeah. and again that's something that has really developed in the last sort of five years in canada now um where before it was just coffee and donuts and that was it but yeah these days there's a combination and that's that's a very old well not old but something we grew up with in australia very much it seems that, and, you know, uh, again, I'm based in Manchester, but spent a lot of time in London, but also traveling the world. And, you know, Aussies have got a great reputation worldwide for coffee. You know, I used yeah. to go to Ozone in London a lot, I think, like, I don't know, 10 years ago. And that was one of, the, I think, the first pioneers really that did great food and coffee. And it was a great experience, open plan, that sort of roastery inside. And I can kind of see that. So, you know, you have got this reputation worldwide of it. In terms of your corporate job, obviously, you said that. What gave you the confidence to say this was it? Like, you know, um, what made you say, I'm going to go all in into coffee now? Uh, craziness. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, you couldn't do uh, the corporate slog anymore. Yeah, it, it, it'd been burning in my, in my mind and my heart for a while. Um, yeah. And just something happened in the corporate environment where, um, again, it was that opportunity to either stay where I was or go do what I wanted to do. And... Yeah. Um, you know, it was, uh, that was six years ago now and, you know, haven't regretted a day of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, just took the big jump and, you know, took out a loan, did all that stuff. And, you know, it was real bootstrap startup. It wasn't a glossy cafe to start, still yeah. isn't. But, um, you know, it, it's still a, you know, it was very bootstrap, just, you know, very, very basic just to get going. Um, and to me that, yeah, it was just a, it was, a, I've got to do it now or I never will sort of situation. Yeah. I mean, look, we've, I was saying to you guys before we started recording, and this is episode 30 that we've recorded, and the vast majority of people have followed that trajectory. They've either had corporate jobs or they're following their passions because they were like, I've got to do this. I've really got to, you know, make it happen one day. Was it a similar story for you, Lucas, in terms of like, you know, doing it? Or have you, did you, 
did you come out of the womb with a cup of coffee and go, I, I, I want to do this? Like, you know, where does your passion come from to, to basically run your business? Well, my, it's funny you say that because I think I had my first drink of coffee when I was maybe three or four months old. My wow. my dad's side is is purebred Italian, and so my uh, my nono I would sit on his lap, he'd dip his pinky in the espresso and pop it in my mouth. So that was <laughs> my first time experimenting with coffee. But uh, no, opening the shop was a happy accident for me. Um, my dad owns a bakery next door to uh, like exactly next door to where our shop is, where I'm sitting now, uh, and that's been there 20 years this year. So I grew up working in a bakery. I was a horrible baker, so uh, but a very good talker. So my dad <laughs> threw me in the front of the shop. He's like, you suck at baking, but you're a good talker. So go sell some bread for me. So I got my start, I guess, more so in customer service. And yeah. um, on my mom's side, her father had a, a business for 50 years in Niagara Falls, uh, a, a, a basically a, a Niagara Falls staple. A, a, it's a they, st they brought roasted chicken to, to the area. So it was like pressure cooking was new. Uh, back then. Uh, but anyway, so uh, it, I've had small business on both sides, food service mostly. Um, and the building that the Black Sheep is in currently came up for sale um, and drastically lowered in price because there was fire damage and water damage and animal infestation, everything you could possibly imagine. Uh, and so my dad purchased the building and he wanted me to run a salon for him because I'm I like schmoozing. And uh, <laughs> so that was kind of that was the plan. But then the person that was supposed to run the salon, uh, like the actual expert in, in hair, uh, dropped out. She had two young girls and was too much of a risk. So my dad said, hey, didn't you mention that you wanted to do a cafe? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. But when he said that, I was 19, right? So I yeah. was like, yeah, I mean, sure. I was two years ago when I was high school, I, I thought I might do coffee. And um, sure enough, um, we opened the shop two years later when I, I just turned 21. Um, I thought my dad was, was going to jump in and help me with it, but he's like, no, it's, it's your shop. You're paying the bills. Here's the key. Go ahead. Um, and so that's what happened. And now seven years later, almost, uh, I, it was, I fell in love with coffee kind of after I've people was my first love. I uh, always drank coffee and enjoyed drinking yeah. it, but I had, I'd never made a cup of coffee until I opened the shop. Um, and I just got very lucky because the first two or three years, we had another roaster, a local roaster doing our beans for us and their direct trade. And that's kind of how I fell in love with specialty and, and learning the relationship between farmer, roaster and consumer. Um, and so I had my first origin trip in, in 2017, went to Nicaragua with um, with Graham from Monogram Coffee Roasters in Cambridge. And yeah. I, I don't know, maybe uh, Jake knows Troy from Outpost um, mm. in Toronto. He's a friend of mine. So we went to Nicaragua together and that's that's when I fell in love with coffee. And I think that's when we started taking it a little bit more seriously was about a year and a half after we opened. Wow, that is quite a story actually, in terms of that. It's, uh, and I think probably in terms of what you just said really actually, which I always wanna pick up on about, you know, socializing. If you think about coffee and the history, I mean, I'm not an expert in the slightest, but obviously the coffee houses of the UK or wherever were the original meeting up places. It's a bit like having a beer or whatever. It's that social situation. It's that, you know, stimulated conversation. It's where people would meet up. So it's a good way to have got into it. But clearly you now have the deep passion. You know, you've been to Nicaragua, all that sort of stuff. I was actually, we were doing tea last week. You know, don't worry, there, there is a plan in my head when I'm planning the podcast. <laughs> so we have a different theme each week, but we were discussing tea. One of our guests, she'd actually just recently been, again, I think to South America, to tea plantations, and had been to India, and just had this burning desire to, like you said, get deep involved in terms of who's creating it, telling those mm. stories in her tea place and being able to kind of reflect that to the customer. And her customers love that because it's not just like a commodity it's not just like, well, I stack the beans high, wang them out, make as much profit as possible and do that. Um, I want to bring you into this as well, Jimmy, because like, you know, you told us you just started. You told us like before the pandemic, it's been a rough couple of years. I, I think we all know this. Yeah. Um, but, but what were you doing before that? I mean, were you working in a coffee shop? Do you have an interest or were you like, you know, corporate high flyer? You were running, no, uh, not driving cars. Days. What were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> driving cars <laughs> a little bit of everything but yeah. um i've actually started in coffee like straight after graduating uni and that was maybe like 12 years ago and right I've, ever since being in coffee yeah i never stopped even for a month even for a day um so i've started as a barista and this is where i've met my my, my current wife and yeah and you know it from barista, I progressed into head barista and then into more like management role. 
And that was all, all around working in cafes. And mm. that was maybe around three or four, four years, about four years full time. And then I decided that I wanted to stay in coffee. And but what what was out there really like? I started doing a research, and then I figured out that I probably should start working in a coffee roastery. Yeah. And I found I got myself a job at a local coffee roastery, and then I started fixing machines for a bit, and then started actually developing the education program. And then um, I've started competing as well. So loads of coffee competitions, national and international. And then I opened the first SCA training campus for the Southwest in UK. Right, I right. developed it and I did, I, I became a Q-grader and I started um, doing a lot of QC and sourcing. So I went traveling in Central America, in El Salvador, Panama, and then in Africa, in Kenya, where I've, I've done a little bit of consultancy there as well. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, just before the pandemic, we've decided to just uh, open the, co the cafe. Yeah. Just because I think that was the only thing that I needed to kind of learn, you know, to just run your own business. Yeah. Um, and, and without and needing was, the uh, without wanting to spoil the ending because the the ending is still to be written is is yeah. it proving a success now that we're hopefully coming out of the pandemic is it too early I to think, see you know like i think i think it has been a huge success actually i think i think all of the combination of all of this experience from cafes and roasteries and sourcing and everything really it's worked really well luckily yeah. And the fact that when shortly after we opened our cafe, we went into lockdown and it was scary. Yeah. Um, but luckily our cafe is kind of um, more like, it is central area, but also it's partly residential area. So it's kind of, we, we have, we've been lucky in a sense that people worked from home and they could come out and grab a quick takeaway coffee and cake. Um, uh -huh. And I think that's one of the important things which has come out of the pandemic. I mean, I don't want to dwell too much on it. I think we've all had enough of it, really, the last couple yeah. of years. But I think there has been a rallying around of communities, again, to use that word community, in terms of people supporting local businesses, people realising yeah. that local businesses need extra help or patronage or whatever to try and get them off the ground and help. So I guess you've been able to maybe even potentially develop a deep relationship with those customers over the last couple of years. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. They still still keep coming, so yeah, <laughs> um, it's a very much like you guys, you know, like it's very community kind of local vibe, you know, and we're so proud and we love our customers, you know, we couldn't have done it without them, and it's so lucky. Yeah. So it's definitely a teamwork, and we serve amazing coffee, and we chat a lot to to our customers. We know all of their stuff and even their dogs and pets, but you know, it's at the end of the day, it's all all about the community, you know, and you. And, and also in coffee, it's all about the community, the global community. Yeah, coffee definitely. is very, very community focused industry, you know. Yeah. Um, if I didn't know you and other people, and so I would never be able to progress. So it's nobody else would be. So, you know. And I'm amazed yeah. as well, guys. Like, you know, like, again, I'll use my local coffee shop as an example. It's, it's a great place, but I'll see loads of baristas in there who work all over in different places in Manchester or whatever, and they'll either pick up a shift or they'll help a friend out or they'll do whatever. Yeah. It really is that global community, like you said, of people knowing each other. I've seen people going for cuppings at Berlin and whatever, you know, like it's a, it's a really yeah. exciting industry as well. Um, I'm going to put you guys on the spot right now. Um, go in, whoever wants to who grab it first. What makes a really good cup of coffee? Who's going to I'll go. I think that it's kind of a loaded question because it really is going to depend on on the consumer and something I learned the hard way in my own shop, which is, you know, obviously when you're the owner, it doesn't mean that you know the most, but it definitely means that you 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 have an idea of what you like, right? And, and you have an idea of what works for you. And so, you know, when we bring in new coffees or we'll get a sample and I'll do a little sample roast of it, we'll cup it with my staff and I'll be like, oh man, love the acidity on this coffee. It's, oh, it's so bright. It's so whatever. And then my staff will take a drink. They're like, oh, 
I, I, then they hate it, right? And yeah. so then you'll try it with customers and you'll see different reactions from customers. Hence why roasters don't have one specific roast on the shelf. Because if there's one golden cup, then why sell any other coffees, right? So mm-hmm. I think the number one thing to do is, is when you're dialing in coffees that you're going to have as uh, selections for your customers is making sure that you have the best coffee of all sorts of different, if you want to call them genres of coffees, you know? Um, when, when I first opened, everybody in specialty expects you to do like the lightest possible roast from the same places, the same varieties. Then you start to see, you know, some experimenting happening. Like uh, there's a place in Canada uh, called Rabbit Hole, which you guys probably have heard of now. um, And they brought in specialty Robusta. And it's Mm -hmm. honestly one of the better coffees I've ever had in my life. So, you know, just not, not following certain parameters, as long as these things are good and being sourced from good places, then I think that's ultimately what's going to make a good cup. Yeah. And I've been reading a lot about Robusta recently, kind of almost like a, obviously, I, you know, again, I, I'm no massive expert, but, you know, it's usually Arabica beans, I believe, but the Robusta ones are as like double the health benefits or something from it or antioxidants or something. Again, is this just crap I'm reading in the newspapers or is there some kind of proof in that as well? Probably both. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I think it's an industry thing as well with, with Robusta. It's, you know, <clears throat> the Arabica beans, it's getting harder to, supply them yes. um robusta is definitely something that you can grow at a lower altitude it's easy to grow it's uh you know and again i've been hearing similar stuff like it's coming along to be a point where you know we're going to be able to use it well uh and start replacing it in time with the rabbit I mean, partly because we're going to have to and partly because you know it's of a good quality so yeah. yeah, I hear a similar thing in terms of wine industry as well. You know, like obviously as certain wine grapes become so popular and there's this demand on it, obviously they're ripping up more traditional vines or whatever to grow this. But then there is an opportunity in terms of more traditional vines and you know independence and stuff like that as well. You know, they can't all just be Malbec and Pinot Noir or, or whatever as well. So it's probably similar things. You know, there's always going to be this macro mass market stuff as well that's needed, but there is still kind of room in there. Um, in terms of that kind of like, uh, you know, coffee, in terms of actually kind of like drinking it, you know, like I said, I, I've been a fan for many years, but if I wanted to take myself on a coffee journey and I'm somebody, like I said, who's been drink probably drinks two or three cups a day, what could I do myself to maybe become, you know, maybe treat it less as a commodity and become more of a, uh, you know, connoisseur, I guess. You know, like what would your suggestions be that you know I could take myself on a coffee journey? Like, where where could I get started? Again, I'm just going to throw well, this in there. Uh, yeah, you you go ahead. Uh, I mean, for me, I'd just say go go visit local coffee shops. Um, yeah, it's make make an effort to not go to a chain. Um, you know, learn in your own local area. What are the ones that are independent coffee shops? Um, truly independent, owned by the owner, that's run by the owner, that sort of stuff. Um, and, you know, either talk to the barista or if the owner's there, have a chat to the owner and just start going, you know, what's the coffee that you're using? Um, you know, you can do your own research online and do your own reading as well because there's things like acidity and boldness and there's, you know, terminology that is similar to the wine industry but isn't. Um, but it's like, you know, there's def- definitely phrases that you can use when you're talking to baristas. But I think, you know, go in and go, look, I'm a novice. Give me something yeah. that I might like. Um, you know, a good, a good barista or a good coffee shop will go, you know, do you like acidic drinks? Do you like, you know, non-acidic drinks? What do you, what's your, you know, what do you like? Um, and then make an effort to go to different coffee shops. You're going to come across great coffee. You're going to come across average coffee, you know. And just, again, it's like a wine journey where you do go, you know, start exploring yourself and, and finding for yourself. And for any, and, and we'll, I think Jimmy's got something to say on this, Jimmy. Yeah, or, or what you can do is when I when I used to work for a coffee roastery, you know, with loads of people like you, like enthusiasts, they would just book a visit, you know, and yeah. they would just come and I would take them for a little tour and explain them, this is, show them green coffee, this is how it looks like, open them a bag, this is how it smells like this is how we roast it for how long to what temperature and then we go upstairs we do a little cupping explain them what this coffee is and from what origin and it's quite interesting to get yeah. like a short insight on on what actually coffee is um you know co- co- coffee shops is great as well but sometimes can be quite busy you know 
yeah mm. um, so I would say look out for some like foundation educational programs that run for maybe half a day or a day and get yourself into like learning some interesting things about coffee in there you know and uh, and I asked yeah. this question as well guys because you know obviously the vast majority of people who listen and watch our show are entrepreneurs who again are probably smashing numerous coffees a day but it's more of like a yeah. in between meetings or whatever and i think you know everybody who does listen is usually inquisitive type you know they want to learn they want to try new things they want to do it so i think from what you're saying is maybe just take a few minutes to think about what you're doing develop a relationship with the barista or whatever if it is quiet use the opportunity to ask more questions find out a little bit more about yeah. it and, you know, like, again, being into beer and wine, I use apps like Untapped and Vivino. Is there a great app that would, you know, that I could use to, 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 to capture my coffee experiences so I can remember them? Or is there anything which would be an industry thing that you'd recommend? Is it, uh, in the UK, there's, a, there's an app called Best Coffee App. Okay. So you can download it. And basically, it's like the best coffee shops, the specialty coffee shops are on there. And um, it just works as Google Maps, basically, but with, okay. with all the, the good cafes that are included in there. So this can be an option for you if you wanted to find a, a, a nice, good coffee shop where you wanted to connect to, to people and drink good coffee. Okay, this is good to know. Yeah. And for, for you guys, do you know of any kind of like rating app or anything? Or is that just not here? Or are you going to go and see if you can start coding it right now, knowing that it, it might be <laughs> a billion dollar opportunity? <laughs> I know. Uh, I mean, there's. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jake. So, uh, sorry, I was just going to say. I know there's. Uh, there was a couple of trials going on. I uh, when I first started out, I came across them, but can't recall the names. And I think they've. They might have gone away. So I don't know if Lucas, you might know. Any. I think the one you might be thinking of, uh, the one that I know of, is Third Wave. Um, mm. I know. In the okay. GTA area, and it comes down to where we are, and then a bit of Montreal, Quebec area. Uh, they're there, but. The only problem I find with rating apps for anything is that unless it's enormous uh, and there's a huge reach, you're not going to be getting enough feedback that's worthwhile. So yeah. I like to treat coffee the same way I treat anything. Like if I'm going to travel in the States and I want to try and, and find a good, good pizza shop, you talk to locals, find someone who likes pizza and then ask them their favorite pizza sh shop. And I find that's the way you're going to find the best pizza. It's the same way you're going to find the best coffee. Um, I mean, Google to this day is still the most reliable. If you type in coffee roaster near me, it's going to give you, you know, a list of five or six people. And, you know, if they've got 2000 reviews and it's a 4.6, 4.7, you're probably looking at a decent shot. I'm taking that advice. You know, that's what I would do in the old days before technology. I'm going to go back to this phone in the bin, do more, be more Lucas, yeah. get out on the street and actually ask people and, and try and get involved as well. It's, it's the best way. I mean, like in mm. Maryland, where we are, we're such a small city. We have 52,000 people here, right? Yeah. So we, we cannot rely on foot traffic. Like in larger cities, you've got five, 6,000 people walking by an hour. I'm lucky. I'm, I can see the front door from here. I haven't seen any feet since we started this podcast, other than the people that parked their car and walked into my shop. So <laughs> Um, you know, when you're a destination place like us, you really rely heavily on feedback, you know, and you need, you need to have something that draws people in. And I find that word of mouth and building on community is, is even in big cities is the most important thing. Yeah, mm. brilliant. Yeah. That sounds good. Right. We're going to move through into part two of our show, which again, regular listeners and viewers will know that it's all about talking about methods and some of your top tips for, you know, basically growing a business. And these could obviously be used in any industry who obviously, um, you know, like would, would want to develop their business. So the first question I've got to you, which again, I'd be really interested to get your take on this is about branding because we've talked today about customer service. We've talked about community. We've talked about obviously good coffee. If you guys aren't selling great coffee, then you're probably not going to get regular customers kind of coming through your doors. But what's your approach to branding and how the brand has developed over time? You've all got very distinctive Instagrams. You've all got distinctive brands. I'm interested to know like how you started on your brand, how that's developed over time, and obviously your approach in terms of ambience and the vibe you're trying to give off. Who wants to grab this? Well, Shall I start first? <laughs> <laughs> you go for it. You're probably okay. the, the one who's come up with the brand the, the most recent anyway, so you go for it. Because our, our, our brand is probably the, the most very basic kind of clean brand. Um, basically, when we started building the brand, I was thinking, 
first of all, in order to build a good brand, you have to know really well, or at least for myself, the actual industry and where do you want to be? Where, where do you want to fit within that picture? Yeah. Um, do you want it to be um, like a commercial cafe that you want it to reach every single customer and be like really up front, out there, very easy, recognizable brand? Or do you want it to be a really clean, quirky brand? Or it's just entirely up to you, really. Like it depends what you want to do. But our initial idea was to serve really high quality coffees and then I took an inspiration from Michelin star restaurants basically so there's a restaurant in London in East London it's called Lyles so I went there I, I, I had a meal and everything was incredible but what blew me away was the simplicity of how the tables were laid out and their brand was really simple the food was incredible the service was incredible but overall, everything was very simple, mm. but very, very well executed. And this is what I wanted to create it with our brand. Something so you wanted to simple. kind of get out of the way almost and actually yes. let the great coffee and experience do the talking for you. Yeah, exactly. So to do that, I wanted to, to basically create a really clean and simple brand without shouting it too much. And uh, that's exactly what we did. It's just white and like coffee colored logo with, with our name and then that's it. And and yeah, it's really, really simple. But and because, yeah, the, basically, and because yeah. I obviously knackered the uh, opening with the uh, with the pronunciation of the name, Tell me more about that as well. Like, what made you decide on the name and just go? Do you know what this is going to be? Who we are? Well, th this is a very actually accidental thing. I was looking for something that it, it's easy to kind of remember, um, and probably like like something coffee. So yeah. I was looking for different things, and initially I was planning maybe to be monolith coffee, um, but monolith kind of means like a solid kind of concrete block yeah. you know but then i was like i showed it to a friend of mine he said oh that sounds like a black metal band probably wouldn't work <laughs> <laughs> and i was like yeah fair play and then i started browsing some old english words and i came across this word swevan and it was interested uh, it was interesting because um Apparently, it was used in, in English literature in the 18th century, and then it was dis discontinued, and it, it, it hasn't been used anymore, and, and it meant dream. Um, right. So I was like, oh, Sweven, coffee, Sweven, dream. Oh, that works perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and also, it's myself and my wife's dream anyway, so we, we kind of Very nice. just worked well with our brand then it, it just felt natural and the yeah. logo with the concept with everything and you kind of have to be a little bit lucky as well with the branding because especially mm. when you create it yourself you know you, you start with something and you don't know how things are going to turn around and stuff so luckily our brand worked with with the premises worked with 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 even with the light that goes into the cafe and with everything with the equipment with the coffees we serve and everything just worked really well together and we really well, when i'm in that when i'm down in bristol next i will be expecting to walk <laughs> yeah. in and be in some kind of you know minimalist fantasy or something as i'm sitting there having a coffee with streaming light coming through and, and really absorbed yeah. in it i guess as well with the name and again you know to get too nerdy on this but i guess from an seo google point of view as well it stands out as well if you know it's not like you're competing with something that's like i don't know flat white coffee co or so, do you know yeah. what i mean like it, it's you know it will actually get cut through in terms of search or whatever it's very, it's, it's, it's very distinctive yes and also when i created the brand i've, I've had i've had in mind because we're opening a coffee roastery now yeah and i want it right. to actually the actual logo to look to fit really well as yeah. a coffee roasting brand as well as coffee shop, so very um, cool. To just look, to just look nice on bags and so on. So I had this consideration, and it's all working really well now. Um, well, I'm looking so forward to seeing it as well, like you know, in the flesh and also the evolution of it as well. Um, for you, geckos, Jake, like you know, like uh, where does that come from? 
Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, for me, it was uh, the Golden Gecko was an award that I won uh, back in Australia as part of a team. Um, right. And it was around it was around sustainability and community, um, not in the coffee industry per se, but it was in um, the mining industry. And the company that I used to work for, we, you know, we put a lot of effort in to build uh, a great program around community and sustainability. And so when I came here and I started thinking about the name, um, you know, again, for me, it was that core, what, why am I opening this business and what, what are my values? Like, you know, what, what do I want to instill? Um, and so for me, it was always community sustainability um, to, and just ingrain that into everything where I could, um, everything I did with this business was to incorporate that. So for me, the golden gecko uh, coffee comes from that, from that foundation. Um, it's probably the biggest award I've won in my, you know, in the corporate life. Um, and it was yeah. really exciting. And so, yeah, just to, just to put that into um, and instill everything that we did uh, with those sort of that, those values. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that again, uh, similar to what we were saying before, it's um, there is a bit of luck, you know, you, you do what's passionate and you do what you want to do. Um, but there's also a bit of luck that you hope it sticks. Um, the gecko for me, the actual logo has become quite, uh, you know, we see it around, we've, we've done some merchandising and a lot of people sort of have commented when they've been traveling around Canada that they saw the gecko hat, the gecko toque, um, things like that. So it's, and again, it was just a blind luck. It was nothing. I just wanted a gecko with a coffee bean somehow and yeah. someone designed that for me. Um, so that was really good. And so, uh, it's been really good. And again, the, the yellow for me, golden yellow is all about bright, happy. Um, um, and the, the, the way our shop is, the way I, I guess my mind is, it's, it's a bit of my extension. It's my third place, my third living room. Um, and I enjoy, you know, it's, it's not clean. I admit it's not very clean. It's not the white um, sanitized look of a lot of modern coffee shops, but it's comfortable. Um, it's welcoming. And it's, you know, it's, and that's been always what I've wanted to have. Yeah, and, and I would say to anybody who's listened to this on the audio as well is like check out the branding on the website as well because actually it's really impressive. You know, like the the, the merchandise you sell, it's very eye catching, but you know, it transcends coffee as well. It's you know, I can see people just wanting to buy it, so it really works for me. Um, Lucas, as well, in terms of your branding, I don't want to obviously make assumptions here, but is it from like a you know music skate kind of aesthetic that Black Sheep has come? Is it something deeper? Tell me more about how you thought about the brand initially, how you evolved it, what it means to you, all that sort of stuff. Sure. I, I think I'll probably break mine up into two parts quickly. Yeah, go for it. I'll talk about why I chose what I chose, but then I'll, I'll say how my opinion has changed over time. So <laughs> Please do. <laughs> when, when, when we first opened, like I said, I was 19 when we started the planning, right? So fresh out of high school i did one one year of college just to get my money out of my resp so i could open <laughs> this place and uh anyway what had happened was i was looking for names that what we were going to call it and literally the first thing i thought of was black sheep lounge because at the mm -hmm. time we had no intention on being necessarily coffee centric it's a cafe but we were also gonna have food and desserts and live music and things like that so we i chose lounge because of the verb not necessarily the adjective so you'd be coming in and hanging out right yeah. um and so uh i was i had this picture like a painting by a northern ontarian artist named angelina rona and it was um this girl with big eyes crying holding a black sheep and i always thought of it like you know it's hard to be yourself right it's difficult to really stand up for what you believe in and when i thought of the city that we're in well and it just it resonated with me and I thought this is the place where it lacks an identity there's a whole bunch it's like a hodgepodge of different people and you know it's an old industrial town people lost their jobs and now there's new jobs and a new generation of people that are looking for their next career uh, and so when I thought about opening this place I had all of that in mind um, the aesthetic on the inside is the most chaotic uh, bizarre thing you'd ever see there's like you can't really see it because of the lighting but we have red victorian wallpaper with like black chandelier designs on them and uh, we have about close to 200 paintings in here from 50 60 different local artists they're all different shapes sizes colors different heights they're not all straight they're crooked um, everything else about the shop is very clean and organized but the walls are chaotic and i wanted a place where every time you came you discover something new whether that's 
in the shop on the walls, or uh, it's a conversation with the person you came with, or you come up with a fresh idea because you see something on the wall that made you like, oh man, that would work great for my job. And so that's what the aesthetic on the inside of the Black Sheep was all about. But switching to now, you know, having done this for almost seven years, I realized that, hey, we're a coffee roaster now. Our customers aren't the same. We're trying to reach different types of people now. Mm-hmm. So we need something that's more consistent um, and more easily recognizable. So uh, when COVID started, we started selling our stuff online. Uh, e-commerce was a new thing for me. And um, that's when we started a little bit of a branding change, uh, more simplistic, something like this, yeah. you know, where um, you're not even using all the vowels, which is kind of in right now. Um, simplistic easy to recognize logo. Um, and we made our website very clean. So um, not a lot on it, even the like about us page, it's everything is just one continuous page and just focusing more on the product and who it's from, where it's grown. Um, and I find that our online presence is very different from our community presence. But the only the last thing I want to touch on is I really don't think your branding in the beginning matters that very much. Uh, And the reason I say that is as long as you love it and you believe in it, your customers, when they come in, if your staff is passionate and you're passionate, you can always change your logo. You can even change your name if you want to down the, down the line. People are just good. As long as you believe in it, they'll start to believe in it. And I think that's the number one thing you have to be honest with yourself and with your customers. Um, be open and transparent and the branding can come later when you have more money and can hire a graphic designer and photographers, videographers and that kind of thing. So well, that's very refreshing what you're just saying. I mean, like in terms of your that's, own that's, experience. That's that... on, yeah. yeah. That's, I, I, that's... I was going nice. to say, I've, I've come across so many people that have had um, like paralysis. They can't start a business without the right brand. And it's just like, yeah. move on. Like, you know, yeah. you can figure Get that out. out there. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's a good point. Really good point. I, I just want to pick up. And you, you, sorry, you, Carol Lucas. Sorry, no, I was just going to say, because I, I was hoping that you guys had jumped in on it about that. I mean, I think what kills so many people, especially in coffee, because coffee is a very Instagram friendly business mm. to be in, is people spend all of their startup money on just the general aesthetic and their branding. And then two years later, their shop doesn't exist anymore, you know, because they haven't put enough emphasis on their staff, on training, on, on their product, on research, yeah. on anything. They've just spent all of it on, Hey, we're the sexiest looking coffee shop on Instagram. And then they're not around anymore. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. good advice. Yeah. I, I think again, you know, you've got to have a good product to, to last. And I think it's, mm-hmm. you know, it can look as good as it wants uh on instagram but again you know people move on from that stuff and you know you need your customers to come in the door buying that stuff so yeah yeah and i think that's really interesting what you're just saying as well about almost well you have two businesses now you know you have the online which is almost like a different branding and obviously the 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 physical real world community one i take it the, the the move on the online stuff has been appreciated by everybody there hasn't been any confusion or it's been well recepted Yeah, I mean, the only confusion we've seen is, you know, for some of our super fans, like our super customers, um, when they're trying to buy things, they buy buy everything, anything we put on the site, they buy it, right? And we're appreciative of these people. But then because certain things are kind of web exclusive, just trying to buy those things in store, like using promo codes in store. And I mean, we'll, we'll honor it most of the time but it, that's the only place we've seen confusion but um other than that no it really is two different places because if you think about it like i'll never meet some of the our online customers our staff will never meet them yeah. some of them are you know other countries like we'll, we'll ship to the u.s and we've done a few europe things but i mean it's really not worth the shipping costs sometimes so uh, yeah, yeah. even even if you think canada is such a huge country like people in vancouver i'll never meet these people you know yeah that's true. And that's really great that you've almost managed to now get those two strands as well. You've managed to untangle yourself from just the physical location as well, which, which again, I think is so healthy, especially, you know, I'm hoping this pandemic stuff will end soon, but who knows, but it's always worth having those extra revenue streams, those extra presences, those extra opportunities yeah. they can open up as well. Yeah. Um, quick question to you guys, because you're all, you know, business owners, you clearly all got your heads screwed on in terms of knowing what it's going to take to be successful. You have all got had successful careers. You know, who's your inspiring people in life or any resources, whether that's books, websites, podcasts that just give you the energy to run your business, maybe give given you some good advice. You know, it doesn't have to be Elon Musk or Michelle Obama or whatever the buzz ones are, but who, who kind of gives you like, you know, who, who's your kind of almost like 
mentor that maybe you'd like to point of entrepreneurs towards? Interesting one. Yeah, I'm no one knows I can I can jump yeah, in. You so, go for it. I mean, for, for me, like the obvious family and and friends, the most critical, but also the most supportive. And, and that's always important. Having someone who can tell you honestly, you know, if, if they think what you're doing is good or bad or give you feedback and not worry so much about your feelings. But when it comes to mentors in the actual coffee business, locally, uh, like I mentioned earlier, Graham Braun from Monogram Coffee Roasters. He's in Cambridge, Ontario, which is not maybe an hour and a half from me here, maybe an hour from uh, from Jake. Um, he He's a, an incredible guy. And I was maybe 20 I walked into his shop and he saw me looking around he's like you're a coffee guy aren't you I'm like well not yet but I want to be and he t he literally on Victoria Day he was closed he invited me to come back he had paid two of his staff plus himself and came and just taught me everything you could ever want to know about coffee and not not just like actually how to brew but things that no one teaches you like how many cups and saucers should you order for your shop like you may have 60 seats, but that doesn't mean you need 60, uh, 60 latte cups, you know? And so things like that, that I, were invaluable advice. Um, but of the big, the big hitters um, is Colin Harmon, actually. Uh, he wrote a book called What I Know About Running Coffee Shops. And it's a simple, beautiful little book that it, again, it talks about things that it's not all about total dissolved solids and all the nerdy coffee stuff that we love. Um, but he also talks about like, you know, that he had a break in uh, at one of his shops. And so he started offering discounts to first responders. So now every day there's cops parked outside of his shop <laughs> and it decreases <laughs> the need for, for security. Like it's a genius thing and it's something we adopted. So now we offer half price, any coffee beverage for first responders. And as we were doing this interview, we had two ambulances pull up. So it's just an amazing thing to be able to support <laughs> people in your community, but also, you know, bring a awareness to your your business so i think that was a brilliant book by colin Harmon. and i won't pry too deep in terms of the ambulances there's no like kind of gang warfare going on outside your coffee shop right now you're keeping it cool if this is kind of what's going <laughs> this is a this is a no, brilliant it's good. Game, so if I <laughs> yeah i think it's a great tip as well and i think you know for any other coffee entrepreneurs that's great and we'll link to that on our blog as well the um the book obviously mm. which you just uh, recommended as well yeah sure how about you guys like who, who's inspiring you like are the podcasts are the books you've read whether it's business or otherwise you know like kind of what keeps you on the straight and narrow to, to keep your mind active to keep moving the business forward uh for me i, I was just having a quick look on my phone going what am i listening to um <laughs> and it's I still listen to things like Freakonomics, um, again, just from a general broad uh, alternative thinking sort of thing. Freakonomics to me still remains up there. Um, not all the time, but some really good, uh, interesting articles. Um, the other one, from a marketing point of view, there's the Canadian guy, um, Terry O'Brien, I think it is. He does a really good one um, to, and again, it's a more marketing, history of marketing, um, and it's, um, it's really good just to get an idea of what's happened in the past and marketing ideas, where they worked, where they didn't work. Um, that, was, that was really good. And for me in the coffee industry, there's the one, The History of Coffee, which is just, um, it's a great book where it just traces where coffee came from. Again, yeah. kind of nerdy, but it's kind of cool to see where it's come from. I'm going to check that out, actually, because again, like I said, you know, I, I, I've been drinking coffee. I enjoy coffee, but I'm not an expert. But I think as a, as a, as a lay person, that would be a good book to start, maybe. It's very accessible. It doesn't go into the whole uh, how to make coffee sort of per se. It just the, the root of coffee came from Africa through the Middle East and into Europe um, and then to the world. So it's, it's, a great, it's a great book for learning, you know, just something if you've got something to do on a cold, snowy day to do that sort of thing. Sounds good to me. And how about yourself, Jimmy? Like, you know, mentors, resources, I think I think my biggest inspiration in coffee is the actual industry, you know. Yeah. It's incredible, like from every single aspect and angle of it. And um, also I think I've been hugely inspired by the Scandinavian yep. coffee industry and also um, food industry as well, as restaurants and service and precision and dedication and everything pretty much um there are, there are a lot of books and resources out there that that can also inspire you and also people like uh, james hoffman or scott Rowell and 
you know, you can find loads of things out there that you can learn and get inspired and, you know, but this is again part of, of what I said in the very beginning is the industry is the biggest inspiration and that's why I'm in, in that industry actually. And if I can just say from an external point of view, obviously, you know, we've chatted on email yeah. before today, all of us, but, you know, we haven't done this. I can really see a connection between the three of you already just just because you're in this, you all understand each other's pain points. You understand that you're nodding along to knowing names and stuff like that. And, you know, I can see this be one of these things that you'll stay in touch after this because it's one big community, really. You know, like you are all in this kind of coffee game, but it's enjoyable. And, and I hate sometimes the word lifestyle business gets a really hard rap. But it actually what I'm trying to say in terms of lifestyle, you're all working damn hard to run a business, but you clearly have a passion for what you're doing it's a great kind of, you know, thing that you would look, you enjoy being part of as well. So I think it's great that you can keep learning and I think people will share ideas with each other. There's no like, Oh, well, I can't give this person my secrets. Yeah. You know, like everybody's yeah. trying to build each other up and build an industry together. Cause I guess you all want an industry where there isn't your Starbucks or your Tim Hortons or whatever. I mean, they will always exist. That's always going to be a market for that, but you're doing something else. You know, it's all about that independence. It's all about that community. It's about the customer service, that sort of stuff as well. I think, I think also specialty coffee is one of those industries where you would send people to your competition. You yeah. would say, mm. you should go and check out that cafe. You should go and visit that roastery there. Even you know that they're your competition, but they aren't really because they're part of what, what you all do, right? Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's, that's the magic in our industry. It's just okay. so strong together and we all do it together. And, and that's why we're thriving and we're doing so well. Amazing. And, you know, it's a really good place to be in. Final yeah. question before we move on to our rapid fire round, guys. And this is, you know, again, it doesn't have to be the full like 20 minutes kind of answer to this, but I'd really like to get an idea. And I'm going to start with you, Jake, on this one. What's it actually really like to run your own business, if you could sum it up? Like for anybody who's thinking about starting a business or getting into what's what's your, what's your general feeling of what it's actually like to run a business on a daily basis <laughs> it's it's such a again not a loaded question but it's such a dichotomy depending on how things are going but it it's extremely enjoyable extremely challenging um uh stressful but relaxing like it's got every every opposite to it that i can think of um i mean ultimately it's enjoyable and you've got to I enjoy it because you, for me personally, it's, I've got to enjoy doing it. Yeah. It's not about making the money. Like the money is good and, you know, we need that. Um, and again, my empire building isn't to become a millionaire sort of thing. It's, you know, to enjoy my life, have a good work-life balance. Yeah. Still haven't yeah. found that yet. <laughs> I'm still working on the work-life <laughs> work work balance, um, which is what I went and did my own business for. But yeah. um, no, it, it's, look, it's great. And it, it's not as... What concerns me, I guess, my biggest concern comes when I'm talking to people who want to start their own business. Um, they see, again, Instagram, influencers, these people that make it look easy and they get into either I, A, uh, uh, financial debt or B, emotional debt, where they become so stressed out and so miserable, they're not enjoying what they're doing. Um, and so they lose, they lose track. So I think when you're going into business, you just got to be realistic. Um, be passionate about what you want to do. Um, be open to advice, you know, stick to your course, but, you know, listen to people. Um, yeah. Not everyone's going to give you good advice. Um, some people will give you pretty bad advice. And again, it's up to you to be able to filter out the good from the bad. Mm. Um, but I can't, you know, it, I love it. Like, it, you know, there's days where I go, I've had enough. I'll wake up the next day and go, let's get back at it, do it again. So, you know, it's, um, yeah. it is such a dichotomy of emotions sometimes. <laughs> That, yeah. it, it, this is it i mean like i said we've interviewed so many entrepreneurs on this show and it's a similar thing it's a roller coaster it's a cliche but actually it is um yeah and i think for many people but you know you come back to it because you love it and you know this is what you're into now a question i used to ask people was like could you ever go back to what you were doing in the past and actually i just removed that question from our podcast because actually everybody was clearly loving it there's no need to ask it anymore on the show is because people were like oh yeah i want to go and join wall street again or i want to go and do this or whatever you just couldn't i think when you kind of in it if they do say that then uh, probably they shouldn't be on the show as well uh, <laughs> lucas yourself like you know in terms of your business um you know like what's what's it like well it's funny because i think jake 
pretty much nailed exactly the roller coaster of emotions that you'd go through. Um, but one of the concerns was, would you ever go back? And, and I think the reason why the answer is no is when you are an entrepreneur or a small business owner, once you have your business at a place where it's oiled, you can do other things at the same time, right? Like mm. you don't have to be stuck and you're only a business owner, but when you work a traditional corporate office job, you are stuck, you know, you, you're not able to necessarily take as many risks or take on extra side projects. So, I mean, for me, I've done all sorts of different things. While I opened this shop, I ran for city council, uh, city council successfully. And I did that wow. for uh, almost three years. Um, the reason I gave it up was because of how crazy people are in general. It had nothing to do with ability, but, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've weathered every storm and I would never, ever imagine doing anything else. But I, I, think, I think what matters the most when you're considering if this is the life for you is just knowing, um, you, you have to know that you love it every single day, um, regardless. Like the, the bad stuff still doesn't hurt, you know? It's, it's hard to explain with until you do it, you know? Like when COVID hit, I wasn't so much bummed that we were going to lose money. I was more bummed that I wasn't going to be able to like have face-to-face -face conversations as often, you know, being able to sit down with customers and, and chat with them. But um, yeah, just knowing, knowing what kind of business you want. Cause when you're a small business owner, you have basically one of two options. One is, you know, you have a lifestyle business, like was mentioned where you're here every day and you chat with customers and you have this really awesome experience. And then you have, you know, a small business where you can make um, a buttload of money but it loses a little bit of that magic. There is a, there is a middle ground. Like I think there's a sweet spot, which is what I'm aiming for now. You know, now it's like, okay, I, I'm able to be here every day, but you know, that's what e-commerce is about for us is trying to make a little bit more money. So um, I don't know. I, I, I think that's what sums it up for me. It's refreshing. Look, if you told me literally in that question and answer that you were going to be like, look, I'm just in it for the cash. Uh, pandemic was terrible because our margins were awful. Uh, you know, I, I was ready to sell the business. Fair enough. But, you know, I, I think that's also refreshing. Jimmy, yourself, I don't think you're going to actually give us a curveball here and say that it's like, you know. I think running a business is amazing. Like, it's the best decision I've ever made to work for myself. Yeah. Um, some people advised me that I would never have a day off. I would yeah. say that every day is a day off because I do what I want and what I love. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't really feel like I'm doing anything really um, mm. because I do it constantly, but yeah. it's just what I want to do and what I believe in and what I, I, what I, I'm, you know, good at. So, you know, it, it is really important when you do something for yourself, to believe in it and to to actually take it as, as something that you, you do anyway yeah it's not really a job you know you love it you do it and and you you just do it yeah brilliant and that's it that's <laughs> a perfect way for us to jump into our rapid fire round so like we said keep it short and sweet guys you know like I, I, i'm not rude enough to cut you off but you know like we'll uh, we'll, we'll go straight into a rapid fire round I'm going to go Jake, Lucas, Jimmy, just because that's the order we've just been in for this. So obviously I'll throw these into you. Right, Jake. So I bumped into you in three years time. Where would you like your business to be then? I think uh, better e-commerce uh, presence. And again, from a presence point of view, just more countrywide for, through uh, the e-commerce business. That's where I need to be. So e-commerce, moving more online to, to yeah. complement what you're doing already. Brilliant. Lucas, yourself? Mine's very similar for e-commerce goals, but uh, my family just recently brought, uh, bought a farm property where we're going to be moving our roastery out to. Wow. Um, so we're going to have um, our current location is going to stay uh, cafe. The roastery part's going to move out. So we'll be able to make this an even bigger and uh, more amazing community space. But out there on the farm, it's going to be having tours and another destination. So uh, hopefully in three years, <laughs> it's, it, it, we're able to afford doing both. And it, it hasn't yeah. compromised the integrity of our uh, relationship with customers. So that's, that's my ultimate goal is hoping that the, the new space um, works out well. We haven't opened yet. So goal is that, that nothing changes for us. All very exciting, though. Sounds great. And Jimmy, how about yourself? We are opening a coffee roastery just about now. Um, so we are working on it. We're launching in two weeks time, which is really exciting. Wow. Um, nice. 
what I really wanted to see in the next three years is probably to see our brand in, in some really good places, really good friends and partners around the world, really good cafes, and hopefully we'll continue to support amazing small coffee producers as we've always been doing. And hopefully our cafe will do really well as it's doing really well and um, everything else will fall in place. Brilliant. Yeah. Well, I'm putting a, a note in my diary for a thousand days time just to check in with you guys yeah. and see how you're getting on with this. <laughs> so. Yeah, definitely. We'll catch up again. Um, yeah. As an entrepreneur, again, we'll start with you, Jake. What does success mean to you? Uh, success to me is the, the balance of uh, enjoying my life, the lifestyle I want. Um, so if, if my business can support my lifestyle, then that's successful. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the brand recognition, the anything that comes from that is secondary to the idea of going, um, as an entrepreneur, success is just being able to live my life and not struggling day to day and, you know, being able to, again, travel, for me, travel is a big thing. So I want to be able to travel, do, do those lifestyle things. If uh, my bit, whatever business I run does that and supports that, then that to me is successful. Brilliant. Lucas? I think for me, uh, I, most people I think would say success is getting what you need. And I've been fortunate enough in the years we've been here that the shop's always gotten what it needs to keep going. I, I think for me, my my new definition would be getting what I want. <laughs> so, so you know, like we're making enough money. We've never been struggling to keep the, the lights on, which is, uh, we're very fortunate for that. But now it's, you know, getting away from those razor thin, uh, you know, b- between black and, and red uh, uh, in the bank sheet. So, um, now I think moving forward, the successful uh, success for me would be would getting getting what I want, you know, which is being able to upgrade. We've been fortunate to be able to upgrade our machines. Where in the beginning I couldn't even tell you what the brand of my espresso machine is. Now, you know, I finally got my my the La Marzocco of my dreams and all the Malcona grinders. And uh, next step would be um, you know a new roaster because you can kind of see it here. That's my Probat L12 yeah. from '88, which is a beautiful machine, but. Uh, it's limited because the old guys don't have all the technology and retrofitting is hard to do in Canada right now. So um, I think, yeah, getting a new roaster and then getting the wants would be nice. Brilliant. And how about yourself, Jimmy? What does success mean to you? Enjoying your life. That, right. that is success. Okay. Just to enjoy what you just, just to enjoy what you do. And that is nothing can buy that really. Yeah, and, and after you've made it through the pandemic with a brand new business as well, it seems like you are still really enjoying it. I think that's the most important thing for any entrepreneur or, or business owner is just to enjoy it and love it. And and that's it. And and I think that's success. Okay, cool. Right, a couple more questions. Uh, Jake, most important probably question for you is your favourite country of coffee origin and favourite style of coffee? I have to say the flat white without a doubt. Um, so the flat, the flat white, but I would go uh, very quickly. The milk in Australia is very different to the Canadian milk. Um, right. As much as everyone in Canada claims that they enjoy the flat white here. Once you go to Australia, you will enjoy a proper flat white with milk that I don't know why it's different, but it is. Um, in terms of origin, I'm, I'm not, I'm very not a new age coffee drinker and I enjoy the Colombian Guatemalan coffees. Um, mm-hmm. Just a, a richer flavor, not as acidic. I find uh, acidity is bad for me these days, personally. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the Central and South American beans for me, I, I really enjoy and come across some really good ones there. Yeah, I like the Guatemala myself, actually. I keep an mm. eye out for those. How about yourself, Lucas? Like, uh, favorite style of coffee and a uh, and country of origin? I, it's so hard to answer that question for me because I think for everyday drinking coffees, I, I'm, I've, I've fallen in love with Nicaragua. I think a lot of that has to do with, I've got that honeymoon experience of where, you know, I, I went to Nicaragua, it's my first origin trip and I just fell in love with the people and the country and the coffee. So I think I'm a little biased there, but when it comes to one-off coffees, Kenya is my go-to. And every, every one of my favorite uh, coffees has been from Kenya. So um, I'd have to say that, but then I'm a black coffee guy. So that's a good drip. You can't go wrong with it. Okay, amazing. Jimmy, like, uh, I guess 
how many, uh, first off, how many coffees you drink in a day? 10, 15, 20? And they, uh, oh, what's your favourite style? Yeah. <laughs> well, I my favourite origin country, is, I think at the moment, is Colombia. Yeah. I think that has changed a lot over the years because in the beginning when I started in coffee, I loved, I loved African coffees and Ethiopian, really floral and complex, delicate coffees. Then I moved more on to Panamanian coffees, which are like quite tropical and like exotic. And I hated Colombian coffees. But in recent years, Colombia just grown so much in specialty coffee. Like you just this such versatile selection of varieties and processing techniques and crazy stuff and I, and, and I love it and, and I love pour, pour over it yeah, definitely V60 that's my everyday morning yeah V60 black coffee filter yeah I'm shocked none of us said espresso because that's kind of the go-to yeah. specialty. But, but I, yeah. I think I think drip gets left behind all the time. It's such yeah. a, I mean, that's your everyday thing. If that's got to be the foundation to me, but uh, for Jimmy, I, I just wine. had a beautiful. Co- yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think Jimmy, you'd like this. Uh, we just recently did a honey process pink for bone from uh, Colombia that blew it blew my mind. It was I only got 70, 70 pounds of it. Uh, and we did it as like a special collection, but oh my God, I think that, that pretty much changed my opinion too on Colombian coffees. Yeah, definitely. Amazing. Really good stuff coming out from Colombia. Yeah, unreal. This is the stuff we want to know. And it's good that you've all got obviously crossover Venn diagram style coffee, but you've all got different ideas, which again, fills me and obviously our audience with a lot more kind of a, uh, ideas about what to go out and try next as well. Right, final question that we always ask is like, where would you like to point people towards? So. Uh, where's your social media where's your website where do you hang out online if people want to give you a shout uh, let's go with you first jake yep so we're pretty active on instagram uh golden gecko coffee and then the website is golden um yeah we'd love to hear people's feedback and thoughts and yeah i'd love you to jump and join us and then yeah come visit us if you're ever in west end toronto amazing i will do how about yourself lucas yeah, easy to find also uh, at Black Sheep Niagara, which is N-I-A-G-A-R-A. Uh, that's Instagram and Facebook. And then also on our website, which is blacksheepniagara.com. Um, if you're in Canada, we ship pretty much everywhere in Canada for free over 50 bucks. Brilliant. Sounds good to me. And um, Jimmy, where can we find out more about yourself online? Well, we're pretty active on Instagram. So it's Swev and Coffee, as uh, simple as it is. And yeah. then... We do have Facebook page as well, and we do have a website, which is webhamcoffee.co.uk, and that is being updated at the moment as we speak, and we'll be launching with a brand new website soon, um, which is exciting. So, yeah, you can find us in Bristol as well, you know, if you're coming anytime to London or UK, yeah, just get on a train or just uh, down the M4, and uh, you can come and visit us. The bucket list is growing. The bucket list is growing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, do you know what? Like I said, as we kicked off the show, coffee is one of my uh, most enjoyable things on a daily basis. I'm not an expert, but I feel like I've learned an awful lot today. But it's also been amazing to find out about how you run your businesses, your approach to branding, your attitude. Clearly, you all have a massive passion for us. And, I, and I'm so excited, obviously, that you're following your passions and dreams and are able to basically make it as, 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 as your own business every day. So thanks for coming on the show today. You know, you've been in a really enjoyable bunch of guests as well. Um, and until next time, keep winning. So uh, thank you, everybody. And I'll catch up with you soon. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Take care, guys. <laughs>